Hello, this is Jason Clement, Technical Sales Manager at Isonus, and welcome to the Certification Training Module. This module is Isonus Hardware, the IP Bridge. Our course objectives are to learn the advantages of the IP Bridge, understand the visual indicators, settings, and connections on the IP Bridge, understand the various methods to power the IP Bridge, understand the wiring of the IP Bridge, and understand the accessories that can be used with the IP Bridge and why they would be used. So first off, what is the IP bridge? The IP bridge is the encoder for the access control world. It's available in two or three door units. It can store up to 20,000 card holders, 5,000 events, and 32 time zones. Local decision making, the same as the power net. DIN rail mountable for easy mounting. Various power methods, 12, 24 volt DC and PoE. AES 256-bit encryption. Dual network ports for connection of multiple IP bridges. I can daisy chain 32 of these IP bridges off of one switch port. Standard Wigan input ensures compatibility with a wide range of technology. So let's take a look at the IP bridge basic connections. We have an RJ45 to the network switch. And we have an RJ45 to the next device. This is where we can daisy chain multiple IP bridges off of one switch port. If we're using external power, our 12 to 28 volt DC input is on the side there. If we want to daisy chain power to the next device, our 12 to 28 volt DC output to the next device is on the right hand side. Our IP bridge status LEDs. This shows whether the unit is powered up, any boot status, or any errors and then individual door status, if the door is locked or unlocked, etc. So let's take a look at the IP bridge device connections. We have our reader input, which is a standard Wigand input, which is 90% of the legacy technology out there. A 10 volt DC output for the readers, a beeper output, and red and green LED outputs. While Wigand communicates between the reader and the IP bridge, sometimes you have to control the LEDs that are on there to show whether the door is locked or unlocked or whether a card has been read. And if you want the beeper to sound, you have to connect to the beeper output. Our inputs, request to exit, door status, and an auxiliary input. And our outputs, a Form C relay rated at 2 amps at 30 volts DC for our electric lock and two TTL outputs. Our DC power terminals. When we are powering this using PoE, these will provide 12 volt DC. When using an external power supply, the voltage of that power supply will be provided on these terminals. For example, if you use a 24 volt DC power supply to power the IP bridge, 24 volt DC will be provided on the DC power terminals. So let's take a closer look at the terminals on an individual door. We have our DC power, and remember, if it's powered by PoE, it's 12 volts. If it's powered by an external power supply, it's whatever the voltage is on that external power supply. Here's our lock relay, our Form C relay, rated 30 volts DC at 2 amps. Our two TTL outputs, and again, we would use the SRM module to control those. And our request to exit and door status inputs. On the bottom of the unit, we have our auxiliary input. We have our reader input. And then we have our power for our readers, which is 10 volt DC. So let's talk about using PoE to power the IP bridge. Here we can see we have an IP bridge connected to our network switch providing AF or AT power. Since we've used this IP bridge to replace a legacy access control panel, we're gonna take the proprietary wiring off of that access control panel and tie it into our IP bridge. This allows us to utilize all of the existing infrastructure at the door already. 802.3 AF power will provide a total of 600 milliamps at 12 volt DC. The IP bridges come in two or three door units, but if we only have one door connected to it, 802.3 AF power will probably give us enough power that we need. If we have two or three doors attached to the IP bridge, we'll want to use 802.3 AT power. This will provide a total of 1.6 amps at 12 volt DC. Even with three doors connected to the IP bridge, that still gives us a little over half an amp per door, which should be more than enough to provide power for the peripheral devices. Using 802.3 AT power, the downstream network port can provide 802.3 AF power. 
if there is enough power left over from the devices connected. So if you use the total 1.6 amps while powering it using AT, you will not have enough power to provide AF power out that secondary port. So let's take a look at the IP bridge downstream PoE settings. By default, the IP bridge will not send PoE out of the downstream port. To enable PoE out the downstream port, pop the cover off and move JP1 across terminals 2 and 3 and then replace the cover. Now you will have PoE on a downstream port as long as you have enough power left over on the IP bridge from the other devices connected to it. Now let's take a look at using a 12 to 28 volt DC external power supply. If we're replacing a legacy access control system, chances are they've got a lot of these power supplies and they've probably got both 12 and 24 volt DC power supplies. So we'll utilize that existing power supply from the legacy system. The downstream power port can provide power to other bridges. So if we have a six door control panel and we have two three door bridges, we can just use the jumper port to provide power to the second IP bridge. That daisy chain power is rated at 4 amps at 12 volt DC or 2 amps at 24 volt DC. So be careful on how many IP bridges you daisy chain. With the IP bridge, we still have the same inrush and back EMF issues inherent with electric locks. These are solved the same way as the power net to make it easy for the installer. Our inrush suppressor will protect against the magnetic locks. And our diode will protect on the electric strike side. The IP bridge comes bundled with two or three diodes depending on whether it's a two or a three door bridge. Again, our secondary relay module for our TTL outputs. These are rated at two amps at 30 volts DC. Our power cables utilize existing power supplies from legacy systems. Note the connector on there. You will need to purchase these power cables along with the IP bridge. The downstream power port can provide power to other IP bridges. Again, that daisy chain power is rated at 4 amps at 12 volt DC or 2 amps at 24 volt DC. So let's review our course objectives. We talked about the advantages of the IP bridge and that it's the encoder of the access control world. In earlier courses, we learned that we use the IP bridge to take over legacy access control systems. We discussed the visual indicators, settings, and connections on the IP bridge. Basically, we're going to replace a legacy access control panel, tie the Wigan readers in and other peripheral devices, and connect these to the network. We talked about the various methods to power the IP bridge. PoE, either 802.3 AF or AT, depending on how much power we need, or 12 to 28 volt DC using the legacy access control power supplies. We discussed a little bit of the wiring of the IP bridge, and in future modules we'll discuss some more advanced wiring. We discussed the accessories that can be used with the IP bridge and why they would be used. The SRM module and the power cords that we need to connect to the legacy access control power supplies. Thank you for attending this course and we hope it was beneficial to you. Have a great day.